This evening we are beginning a series of discussions on practical psychology with the hope that we can bring some rather simple problems into more direct focus and in this way help each person to understand a little better some of the subjective processes going on within himself. We're starting this evening with a study of the defense mechanism or defense reaction. And this has to be considered under two general headings. First, the normal defense reaction. And second, the abnormal defense reaction. It is perfectly normal for a person in difficulty to try to extricate himself in any way that he can. It is also quite normal for each of us to defend uh, things which we regard to be important. And if necessary, to develop a series of mechanisms or contrivances to make such defense possible. Thus life, in most instances, is largely a matter of defense. The individual is attempting to protect himself and his values all the way through the years. And in the smaller everyday occurrences, he is largely attempting to protect his own ego, to protect the decisions which he has made, the attitudes which he holds, the peculiarities which are natural to his nature. These become rather cherished factors in his personality. And he seeks to protect them even as he seeks to protect his life, his honor, and his worldly goods. Thus the defense mechanism or defense process arises early in life. It continues with us through the years, and if it is within the normalcy range, we carry it on to the end of life without any very serious inconvenience and without more than the usual number of psychic shocks. Even so, in its most normal forms, the defense mechanism is worthy of some thought. It nearly always exists for one reason only, that in some manner the individual is inadequate. Now this is a large term, and we don't want to appear uh, autocratic in our use of it or to belittle the fact that nearly every person must be inadequate in something. There's nothing criminal or wrong about not knowing everything or being able to meet every emergency. Nor is there any reason why we should not occasionally admit that we are in the presence of an obstacle greater than we can meet or in the presence of a situation that is distinctly too big for us. The normal person is the first to admit these basic facts. If the situation that he is moving into is simply beyond him, and he knows this, then he will raise certain types of defenses against the immediate or approximate danger. A good example of this might be an individual who has allowed himself gradually to drift into debt. He finally awakes one day and finds that he is no longer master of this situation. It is closing in around him and upon him. At the moment, there is really no way in which he can rise victoriously over his adversary. The debt is larger than he can pay. Therefore, there is no use fooling himself about this. And there is very little good to be found in any emotional outburst over the situation. His defense processes must now come into action, and he must find ways, if possible, to avert the coming catastrophe. Perhaps he is able to rearrange his indebtedness so as to give himself additional time in which to extricate his financial situation. Perhaps he is able to go to certain of his creditors and on a very simple and direct uh, basis convince them that if he, they will give him adequate time he can meet his responsibilities. 
If he forthrightly goes after his problem, then he is actually creating a powerful defense program against an emergency. The fact that he attempts to do anything at all is due to the fact that he is defending himself or something that he has, perhaps the loss of most of his possessions. Such defense is within the normal sea range, and there is no particular reason to assume that there's anything wrong with the individual who uses every possible, practical, reasonable, honorable means uh, to extricate himself from the difficulty. Another type of our defense mechanism arises in the small child, but may also drift into the adult years of life. Small child uh, breaks a family rule. It knows that it stands in immediate possibility of punishment. This becomes a rather much of an emergency for a small child. The child probably does realize that it cannot undo what it has done. Therefore, that even a good honorable repentance will not probably prevent parental displeasure. So the child has a number of possible alternatives. One of these is to fess up immediately, face the music, take the punishment, and say, I deserved it. Now, this is very factual, and this kind of thinking is not only pretty much to ask for a child, but is more than we can usually expect from an adult. <laughs> Therefore, we are not uh, able to be certain that this will happen. Although if the child has been properly informed and instructed on problems of personal conduct, it may be strong enough and equipped to do this. The second thing that comes to the child's mind, of course, is to put off the bad news. Uh, always on the ground that time may heal the wounds. The child may be a little unavailable about the time its misdeeds are first noticed. It may have been out somewhere else in the neighborhood. Anything to escape the immediate impact of that first uh, cataclysmic uh, discovery of its fault. Another thing the child may do, and which also adults may do, and that is to begin to spin a yarn, create some kind of a story uh, inclined to perhaps raise this small circumstance almost to a transcendental level. I remember at a revival that I uh, attended inopportunely a number of years ago, <laughs> there was a uh, series of open confessions. They were a little competitive, but I guess the majority of them were well-intentioned. One individual who had gotten into a difficulty uh, explained it by simply saying that they were going along all right, behaving themselves, being nice people, and minding their own business, when the devil came up behind and pushed them. <laughs> well, now this, this thinking is also sometimes uh, used by small children in a little different way. Uh, they are not quite as well informed on the possibilities of the devil as an escape mechanism as the adult is, but they will blame it on circumstances. They didn't really tip over the bottle at all. It was the family cat that did it. And I've even heard them go into long discourses about how some invisible playmate was responsible for the catastrophe. Anything more or less to find a good story and stick with it. That is considered to be uh, the next step. And sometimes these little people uh, in their early uh, life will stick to this story through spanking and punishment weeping and moaning and insisting that they are misunderstood and that what the, the little white lie was really true all the time. Uh, this is another way of attempting to uh, hope that you are going to get out of a difficult situation. Another action, a reaction that is quite common to a small child under these conditions is simply to break into tears, to become a little bit hysterical. Uh, and as the parent's scolding rises, the child becomes ever more miserable and thus uh, works a little scheme, which is also rather practical later in life if you, if you develop a good technique for it. Another thing a child will sometimes do in a condition of this nature is simply lay a deep uh, planned strategy. They will have some nice, pleasant, wonderful, kindly deed already in the foreground for the parents when they get home. So that the first thing that a uh, uh, child does is begin to uh, win the approbation of the parent on some other ground or for some other reason. 
they suddenly become very thoughtful, very obedient, very noble little creatures. And then the parent begins to look around for the broken bottle because they know that it's there somewhere. The, the attitude, it would have to be there because the child is obviously uh, concealing something. This also happens quite frequently with adults. And you know the story of the man who brought the bouquet of flowers home to his wife on an unexpected occasion. She took the flowers, looked at him for a moment and said, well, what did you do that was wrong? Uh, we, um, we have this idea that if people get suddenly very nice, they are concealing something. And this is a problem with small children. But all these are different phases of defense mechanisms. They are simple ways in which the individual tries to escape from some kind of consequence that doesn't seem to be uh, very attractive. Now we get into the same thing sometimes in a pleasant evening parlor discussion of some theme or matter. Someone who seems to be a bit of an authority and is pretty proud of the little that he does know comes into head-on conflict with a real authority on the same subject. This is most embarrassing uh, and, and can cause several bad moments. As soon as the neo-authority discovers that he is bested, he has several possible courses of action. One is to admit it, sit down, and improve his mind. This is a difficult one, however, <laughs> because it has a tendency to cause him to lose face. But sometimes it is better to lose face than it is to lose what is above the face, and the uh, individual must have a choice of some nature. Another possible situation is that realizing that he is bested and there's not much he can do about it, he can try to change the subject. This is also a very reliable in uh, uh, mechanism if we are careful with it, or he may go so far as to attempt to break up the conversation and get all the folks to come over and have a sandwich. Anything to get himself out of the situation of realizing that he can no longer maintain his own position, that he is up against something that is beyond his control at that moment. So nearly all your defense mechanisms rise from the individual being at a disadvantage and being in this position feeling that he must do something about it. Uh, of course this takes a lot of effort and endeavor and thoughtfulness and sometimes conspiracy if the person is not willing to simply admit that he is in the presence of a situation uh, to which he must adjust graciously and without any unnecessary strain or tension. These kinds of defenses go into practically every department of life and we find that under counseling many persons uh, strive to find various types of defenses against hurts, against prejudices, against gossip, slander, ridicule, intolerance, and all such pressures. If these pressures come from the outside, from other people, or from uncontrollable factors, then the person's only solution is to try to take care of it in his own nature. One of the ways that he immediately begins to try to take care of it is to withdraw into himself. If he finds situations around him are not endurable, then he has a tendency to create a new world within his own psychic life. This new world is, generally speaking, a world of interests or activities, and again within the normalcy range, represents a perfectly natural and reasonable uh, compensation for a difficult situation. Uh, to escape boredom, he takes on new interests. Uh, to escape monotony, he creates variation or variety. Uh, to escape uh, certain bigotries, he may move out of a social group. He must have some way out by means of which he can rescue at least a part of his life from the situation that is difficult for him. In close family relationships, the way out is often difficult. Individuals continue to live together over long periods of years without coming to any basic understanding. When this occurs, we have a great tendency for one or both persons to become more and more introspective, to seek inside of themselves for securities or for values which are denied them in their mutual association. This kind of retiral 
uh, is also normal up to a point. And if it is held within the control of the reason or the consciousness, it may even in many instances prove beneficial. An individual with a good retiral, retiral pattern in which they can tremendously vitalize the inner areas of their own consciousness without uh, morbidity or without exaggeration or without some abnormal situation arising in the visualization. Such persons as can attain a normal, if imaginary, life may in many instances protect themselves against serious nervous, mental, or emotional disturbances. Thus, a happy life lived inside of ourselves is not necessarily bad. It does, however, have this tendency to separate us more and more from reality. Now, the great difficulty is to distinguish between the types of reality. We are set trying to separate ourselves from an unpleasant reality. Perhaps, however, in creating the mechanism, we gradually build a wall that protects us from all realities, thus gradually uh, reducing our experience uh, reaction and cutting us off from important lessons that we have to learn. There are some lessons that apparently can only be learned by means of a strong introspective life. There are certain lessons that we will never be able to learn until we realize that our own internal life is our strength. So this lesson can be important, but it is not important if it causes a general block in which our entire objective consciousness uh, it withdraws and leaves us out of contact with the uh, daily realities upon which our experience must be built. Another type of defense mechanism that we find very often is the defense that is built around a basic sense of weakness. Now there are people, many people, who have to create defense mechanisms at one time or another because there is no one in the course of lifetime who will not meet or come in contact somewhere with something stronger than himself. But there is also a constitutional kind of psychic weakness in which the individual will go through life and find himself inadequate to almost every occasion. He is unable to actually face the normal problems of daily existence. He is all weakness. His weakness extends into almost every area, and therefore he is inadequate to almost any situation that arises. Now this weakness may be of one of several kinds. It may be a weakness which simply arises from lack of interest in becoming strong. The person whose mental life is lazy may find that he is, in, he is inadequate or unable to cope with the minds of those around him. If he has neglected the culture, cultivation of his own nature, if he has failed to improve his character in what ways he could, but has simply drifted along upon a surface very largely composed of doing as he pleased, he may have come to almost any emergency ill-prepared. This type of person is therefore almost always on the defensive. Nearly anything in life is too big for him, and he must gradually develop an almost perpetual defense pattern. One of the most common of this type of pattern, of course, is the old-fashioned bluffer. Uh, the bluffer is an individual who is trying desperately to convince other people that he, is ha that he has more ability uh, than he really possesses. On another level, he may be the bully who will keep on bullying until he meets the person who is really stronger than he is, and that's the end of that. Also, the negative kind of individual who attempts uh, constantly to withdraw into a neurotic silence. There are two kinds of silence in this world. One is the silence of the very wise, who could say many things but choose not to and the silence of the very foolish who never had anything to say in the first place. Now, this uh, twofold silence is not always easy to detect which one it is, but uh, 
many people regard silence as a great defense against making a mistake. It's like the old idea, you can't do many things wrong if you do nothing. But of course, doing nothing is itself the greatest wrong that you can perpetuate or perpetrate upon yourself and others. The individual can consequently retire into an almost complete inactivity, rejecting and refusing any situation uh, which might be difficult to face. The weaker he is, the more he has to reject and refuse, until finally this becomes a chronic pattern in his temperament. If the person finding himself inadequate uh, is willing to continue to condone this condition, he must, in the sense of a certain self-pride, try to conceal it. And no matter how well he attempts to conceal it, it will out in the due course of time. And whenever it does appear, it becomes a crisis. The uh, inadequacy then suggests to anyone, it would seem, that the discovery that we are not sufficient to our ordinary needs should inspire us to do something about it. We should become more industrious, we should become better informed, more thoughtful, and attempt to develop those characteristics which we want other people to believe that we possess. This, however, is hard work, and is not a particularly popular form of therapy. In fact, nearly everyone would rather take a sedation and forget about it. But uh, if this goes along and drifts through the years, we develop uh, certain temperaments and personalities which are not particularly ingratiating and certainly never carry us to any marked degree of success. We become drifters, floating along from one negative situation to another until we finally uh, come to the brink of the ultimate negation which is the end of life itself. Thus, uh, in almost every pattern that we live in, we are trying to protect ourselves against hurts, protect ourselves against loss, protect ourselves against being shown that we are wrong. And this is one of the biggest protection problems that we have. Many people have developed a constitutional defense mechanism. They have arranged to live in a kind of world that never existed. By this process alone, they make all the rules of this world non-valid. Uh, they live in a world in which, very largely, they are the creator. The universe is run by rules which they have decided upon. God is the kind of being that they have affirmed God to be. And living in a private world, they are therefore comparatively free from uh, the common vicissitudes of life. Of course, they are also free from all the valuable experiences which life could bring them. And the living in a private universe is a nice defense mechanism, but one of the most dangerous and also ultimately one of the least profitable. All these different patterns work into our daily relationships with each other. And there are very few persons who are able to sort of relax and simply be themselves without fearing they have to apologize or defend. The simple answer, as the Zen monks are used to know and still practice, is that in all of these problems of defense there is no disgrace in not being able to do that which is unreasonable. Therefore, there is no reason why we should not keep the currents of life clear by simply admitting the natural facts of things as we know them and as we experience them. We may in some cases pass through temporary setbacks as a result of this kind of honesty, but in the long run uh, we will gain in stature and certainly enjoy more peace of mind because never mind how we figure it, every lie takes two more to hold it up, and by the time we get through prevaricating a situation or misrepresenting it, we are in far more difficulty than we would be if we said in the beginning, yes, I'm the one that made the mistake, now uh, tell me what I have to do about it and let's get the thing cleaned up. This is the simple, natural way which we all fear. We fear it because of this instinctive, dislike to be wrong. 
it almost seems as though if anyone criticizes us, they're criticizing God in proper person. <laughs> that whatever this divinity is within us is hypersensitive and is particularly, un, uh, particularly unhappy uh, when it is chided for something. Actually, uh, this self-pride or this egoism has become involved in our economic thinking. We feel that if we allow, allow ourselves to be proven wrong in many things, that we will not advance and economically or socially as well as someone else would. We're a little afraid, to be honest, in these things. But there are several reasons why we should give it a good hard thought, because honesty and dishonesty are habit-forming, and we cannot afford to develop the habit of mental dishonesty. It gets us into too many complications as we go along. We therefore can recognize the magnitudes of problems and try to keep them as far as we can in the open. Uh, a defense mechanism that we can understand, that we know why we're doing it, we know how we're doing it, and we know, know what it is attempting to accomplish. If we can keep it out there where we can see all shapes and forms of it, we're at least uh, somewhat protected against the neurotic tendency. But if this process of, of defense uh, becomes automatic, if it becomes an immediate and inevitable reaction arising in ourselves at all occasions, then we're beginning to get in trouble. So I think we can say that the average person in his defenses should give a little more thought to the facts and not permit himself to become emotional over his uh, problems and his efforts to justify either himself or his course of action. This habit of justifying will inevitably ultimately cause us to try to justify something that is not right. Uh, try to prove ourselves wrong, uh, right when we were really wrong. And then we go into a form of mental dishonesty which we can't afford to cultivate. So in most cases your defense mechanism is merely the inner resources of the person rising to meet an emergency. And it should be no more and no less than this, that we use the best we know and the best we have and the best we are to get ourselves out of some difficult situation into which we have perhaps come unknowingly or through the connivance of other persons or through perhaps some a reasonable lack of knowledge for which we could not actually be blamed. The main problem always, therefore, is to look the whole situation over. Now, there are a great many people who have been forced to build defense mechanisms simply because they have endured unreasonable situations too long. And uh, when the person finds that he has to live uh, by some form of artificial defense, against a situation around him, then it is perhaps better for him to contemplate a very honest, head-on uh, attack upon the situation itself. Uh, there are many persons who have ruined their lives trying to endure something, and at the end they have gained nothing, they were not appreciated, they were not uh, thanked, they were not understood, and in many instances they were actually blamed for not having cleared up the situation much earlier. I've known a great many cases of this, and uh, it causes us to pause and wonder whether this so-called patient person was really a patient person or actually a masochist. Many people feel a certain sense of virtue or value from suffering itself and allow themselves to become victims to self-pity mechanisms in their own natures. Such will never produce any real or practical good. Others lack the courage to head into facts. Others uh, lack the honesty, because sometimes to clear up these facts may mean an economic loss. But if the facts are not cleared up, I wonder how much economic gain can, uh, can compensate for 50 years of personal misery. There is a grave question about that, and yet I know people who have attempted it. I know people who should have broken up a situation long ago, 
but because it would have injured them financially, they endured it. Now, after many, many years, these people are utterly miserable and useless, sick, mentally and emotionally unstable, and even though they have protected the economic situation, they cannot even enjoy spending it on. They've lost all sense of value as a result of the compromise of integrity long ago. This situation, then, uh, would again be the subject of defense. You ask an individual why he has done this, and he may have a hundred artificial defense explanations, some of which he hopes that he can believe himself. He very little, uh, very little really believes them, however. And under analysis or under real pressure, he will admit that the reason why he is in his predicament is not because of nobility of character to carry a burden, but because he did not wish to, uh, to give up a plush living for an uncertain future. This type of thing uh, is a mistake, so that uh, even in our times, uh, the damage that is done to the psychic integration by being forced to live a false front or a false way of life uh, should give the person immediate cause to think through his own situation. If he is in a ho an impossible situation, he must do something to actually solve or clarify it. Now, sometimes when he's in an impossible situation, it's because he is impossible. And this is also something that we can't afford to overlook. Many people blame others for characteristics that are essentially their own. One thing we know from uh, many case histories that uh, it isn't always necessary for two persons to change for a situation to improve. Uh, sometimes it is, but very often a valuable experiment can be made by either person who decides to make certain alterations in his own characteristics. Sometimes we are in these difficult situations because our own temperaments make it hard for other people to be honest with us. Uh, they have fallen into the child defense mechanism. They also feel that they must retire, keep quiet, prevaricate, or invent in order to prevent a head-on collision with us. So if one person makes a reasonable adjustment, it will frequently correct the pattern to a degree uh, that it can be solved with reasonable dignity. So, wherever difficulties arise, it's not good uh, to try to use some formularized solution to them. And it is not good to try to create mechanisms in which our own dignity is the first consideration. We can't make it work. There are times that we just can't be dignified and honest and therefore it is far better to be honest. We have to sometimes fa face the simple fact that we've made a pretty bad mess out of something. Uh, this may in itself clear up the situation more rapidly than we realize. Now all these together form certain general uh, situations which we say come within the range of the normal person. There are things that we all do tricks that we have all played at some time during life and uh, escapes that we have all looked for even if we haven't succeeded always in finding them. But now we come into something that becomes a little more dangerous and that is your defense mechanisms in connection with the abnormal or the person in whom these mechanisms do not represent merely moods but are warnings of deep-set tendencies or trends that can lead to mental disease. And here, of course, is where everyone wants to stop short and take a very careful look at himself and the way of life which he is living. Uh, nature has shown us frequently and repeatedly that no way of life that is itself essentially unreasonable can result in good for the person who tries to live it. The life of the person must be a natural, simple, direct, honorable existence or he will be in trouble. Uh, this kind of trouble can get pretty confusing as we go along. But now let us imagine that the small child that we were telling you about 
a little earlier, uh, said that actually she didn't tip over the bottle. Uh, the family cat did it. She knows when she says this that she is lying. Now this in itself means that she is a comparatively normal child. But I have known cases in which having created the pattern, the child gradually came to believe that the cat had tipped over the bottle. And this is where it gets complicated. This is where suddenly the individual is no longer in control of their own lie. Something has happened. And this happens very many times in very many ways. The individual suddenly accepts his own defenses or escapes as real. They are no longer instruments which he can control and use as he sees fit. These instruments become the realities and turn on him. This is one way in which we produce a first-class neurotic. This is the case in which an individual who has used some form of escape device has used it so long and successfully that suddenly it turns and begins to use him. It is like a monster of Frankenstein. It turns on its own inventor. And this happens in a great many different ways. Uh, people who start out controlling uh, the psychic exaggerations of their own minds end up as narcotic addicts end up, hopeless victims of their own bad habits. So there comes a time in which instead of the individual defending himself, he defends his own defense of himself. He may uh, say when someone blames him for something that he does not feel well or that he's had a bad headache or something of that nature, thus trying to excuse himself. If he keeps this up long enough, he will have the headache. The headache will develop within him. The escape mechanism will gradually take over the dominance of his psychic life. And the, the, the mechanism creation which he has fashioned becomes more and more his true self. Now, in the course of uh, various defenses against pressures from the outside, we may not always be entirely consistent. Uh, I've noticed, and many uh, psychologists are aware, that the, as the individual has several different mistakes which he can easily make in life, he has to have several different patterns of defense and escape to take care of these mistakes. Sometimes his defenses are not even consistent with each other. Sometimes he will plead one situation to get out of a certain pattern. Then he will plead the opposite in order to get out of another pattern. Little by little, he may break up his personality into a series of sub-personalities, each one of which is lustily engaged in defending some phase of his own ego. One uh, will defend his truth when he is prevaricating. Another one will defend his philanthropy when he is foreclosing a mortgage. And still another one will defend him as a perfect parent when he hasn't been home sober in five years. Uh, this type of situation, moving in, creates a whole group of defense entities or defense structures within one person. These, in turn, can develop semi-individual existences, creating what we might term phases of split personality. Under these, the individual moves from what he calls a mood to another mood. But actually, all of these moods are merely defenses against some experience or circumstance arising in life. The moment a problem appears over the horizon, the individual shifts into the mood with which he intends to face that problem. Now, if he does this of his own accord, he may just have a difficult disposition. But if he cannot prevent doing this, if it becomes an automatic process, and to his own amazement he finds himself doing uh, one of these peculiar escape actions, then 
his entire psychological integration is threatened. Then the patterns are being set within the psychic nature itself. And he is beginning to operate involuntarily in obedience to these patterns which he has set up. Thus a person with an hysteria pattern will gradually use hysteria for every evasion of life. At first he is perfectly able to put on a spell of hysteria any time he feels like it. Ultimately, however, the, the hysteria pattern grips him and he finds it emerging through himself, compelling him, forcing him to obey it rather than his being able to invoke it when he pleases or when he feels he wants to. So out of the defense patterns we develop certain definite neurotic symptoms. And these neurotic symptoms gradually come to be identified with the person. And as we all of us sort of feel that whatever comes from the inside is ourselves, so surely our neurotic pressures become a natural, normal phase of our own personalities. But as they are not natural and as they are not normal, the moment we give in to these pressures, the moment they become dominant in our lives, we are on our way to trouble. We gradually create personalities which no one can live with. We create attitudes that no one wishes to share. And we uh, damage our own popularity and efficiency, success and health. All these things occur when the individual becomes a true neurotic. And uh, one of the causes of a neurosis is this tremendous urge to protect self against the common ills of the day. So, for one reason or another, we can get into a very complicated situation. Now, one of the cases that has been held against religion by a great many people is that religion offers so many very clever, interesting justifications for being wrong about something. In the first place, uh, religions are of all breeds and kinds. You can get a religion that demands almost anything and rejects almost anything. Some religion will not let you uh, go to the motion pictures. Another religion will not let you eat meat. Another religion will not permit you to see good in anybody else. All of these situations uh, become uh, much involved in the psychology of a neurotic person because you can nearly always find a good quotation somewhere in the scriptures for whatever mood you happen to have at the moment. And this is supposed to overwhelm all controversy on the subject. This is a final word of authority. So if you remember in the Bible in one place it says, Answer a fool according to his folly. This would justify one line of conduct. A few lines off it says, Answer not a fool according to his folly. This starts another line. So you can always quote the one you need. And most people quote the one that makes them appear to be right. Now this is a, a, a splendid device if you're working with believers, but it's pretty uh, hard to make it effective if you happen to be among a group of, uh, so we say, uh, conscientious agnostics. They just do not see it that way. And the more you do that, the more conscientious they will be in their agnosticism, because they will lose much confidence in religion when they see it abused in this way. I knew an individual who had a perfectly foul temper, and one of the most unpleasant tempers I've ever known in a God-fearing individual. Uh, we, people used to say to him, well, you believe in God, you go to church regularly, what do you do about this nasty temper of yours? He said, I haven't got a bad temper. And of course he was ready to explode when he said it. <laughs> but there are moments when you are entitled to righteous indignation. And he suffered in a perpetual state of righteous indignation. Indignation against everything. And yet he was perfectly convinced that he was a good, devout, honest, God-fearing citizen. But he had found one way to escape 
by reading all the cases in the Bible where the Lord lost his temper. And if God can do it, there seems to be no reason why he couldn't. He carefully avoided all quotations about agreeing with thine adversary quickly. He, uh, he read the part that pleased him. Now, I know a great many persons also in various lines of religious thinking have used other phases of religion as a means of defending themselves in an emergency. I've even heard good theologians try to do it to physicists and biologists. I can't say they were very successful, but as far as they were concerned, they were well satisfied with the result. No one else was. But any way in which you can force your point to make it stick by some means that seems to be reasonable or logical. You may be considered even unreasonable, but if you're considered devout at the same time, that's a big help. That takes the edge off of it. It's always wonderful to suffer for your beliefs. And when you can't suffer for anything else, there's a chance of that. And lots of folks make the best possible use of this opportunity to be miserable. The... Uh, whole situation always centers on this one situation, this one axis point, namely the person cannot accept the fact that he can be wrong. It's just something that hurts us all the way through to the bone. Occasionally we have to admit it, but even then uh, we really feel that we're just being humble. Uh, we're really better than we even want other people to think we are. All of these situations lead to habit structures that are peculiar, to say the least. Now, let's imagine for a moment that you are one of those people that does have a quick temper. Perhaps you have a virtuous thought in the fact that you get over it quickly and you don't hold grudges. That's one nice, uh, that helps, and it is, uh, it is good. But if you don't hold grudges, why not stop the temper before this? Why have to have this beautiful spirit of repentance set in? Why not prevent it and save energy for other purposes? Well, some people feel that a good repentance is something worth living for, and that uh, one of the ways to repent is to do something that justifies it. And uh, I know among the Slavonian people in southern Europe and so forth, southeastern Europe, there are religious sects that, uh, that really almost recommend individual sin regularly in order that he can have a good wholehearted repentance about once a month. <laughs> now, uh, we would say this isn't exactly the best way to do things, but there are people who sincerely believe it. In fact, they've made creeds out of it. In fact, there are a great number of them who hold this attitude. But I think the real answer lies in not doing these things in the first place if we can possibly avoid them. So as you sit down and study your own life a little, think for just a moment occasionally about the instincts and impulses with which you react to sudden and unexpected pressure. If the doorbell rings and someone comes to see you and you have not expected and is going to considerably discomfort or inconvenience you, how are you going to react to this? What is your natural reaction? I don't mean what are you going to say, because in all probabilities you will say, why, well, my dear Mrs. Smith, I am delighted. <laughs> what I'm wondering is what you are thinking, uh, whether or not you are wishing her into the one of the remote sections of perdition at about that time. Or supposing in some conversation that comes up, someone makes a statement that you really disagree with. Uh, the sta a statement which causes a slight boiling in your own nature. How are you going to handle this? Another time when there's a problem of two persons, yourself and someone else, trying to plan something. Are you going to press your plan to the end, or are you going to let the other person have a chance at the plan? That is another situation that comes along. To what degree are we willing to sacrifice our own pleasures or our own comforts for some other person for whom we are presumed to have regard? To what degree are we going to allow the small children to keep us home when we want to go out? 
And to what degree are we going to resent the fact that these small children do this? And so on down through hundreds of different ordinary episodes. What are the natural reactions that we have to what we call interference? Are we going to immediately begin to build escapes, defenses? Are we going to try to find uh, some way of shifting these responsibilities? Are we going to deny them? Are we going to bear them with grudging martyrdom? Or what are we going to do about them? If we're good, healthy people and our psychic integration is normal, we're going to think these problems through very rapidly. Incidentally, how long does it take to think a problem through? It probably would be very difficult for us to estimate the time factor at all. If we could move mentally by the most direct path or the direct course through the problem to its reasonable solution, with a normal, ordinary, reasonable equipment of mind of our own, nothing spectacular or fussy, just a reasonably good intellect, the average person can probably think a situation from its cause to its conclusion in something like a third of a minute. Why doesn't he do it? Because he spends two hours trying to think through the thing into some solution or pattern that he wants. It isn't the fact that is slowing him up. It's his effort to escape the fact, change the shape of the fact, emotionalize himself in or out of the fact, rationalize his own defenses against the fact, and say to himself in a nice, long, heart-to-heart -heart talk how miserable the fact is making him and how he dislikes somebody who has tossed it at him. By the time he gets through with this, the decision takes anywhere from a half a day to two weeks. For perhaps the whole subject will be dead before the decision is made. But the simple thinking through of the fact to its proper conclusion, what is the truth of this matter? What is the reality in it? What is the thing that should be done? Not what I want to do, but what is the thing that should be done? If the person could move into this pattern rather quickly and quietly and with very little resistance to the pattern, if facts are more important to him than anything else, there is very little likelihood that he'll ever be a neurotic. He will be able to handle the facts. If the fact says he shouldn't go out, he'll stay home. If the fact says that he should go out, he will go. If the facts that he, as he finds them, means that some whim of his own will damage or injure or hurt another person, he will instinctively not indulge himself. He will weigh his values as to what is the better, the wiser thing to do, always realizing that maturity must lead, and that if his mind is quicker, his decision is better, his sense of values are more real than those of another person, then in this he becomes responsible for that other person as well as himself. In other words, if he knows better, then he becomes responsible for this decision, because he is the one who is capable of arriving at it in a reasonable manner. So in all these difficult situations that come along, there are very simple answers. And the polygraph shows this very clearly. That's the lie detector. The lie detector indicates very definitely that when man's thinking approaches questions, his answers are scriptural. Well, the good book says, let thine answer be yea, yea, or nay, nay. And that is exactly the way it is. The individual's reaction under test conditions is instantaneous and complete. There is no batting around the bush. Always the indirect, inconclusive answer is evasion. And that is how the lie detector determines the criminal as the evader, as the person who will not face the facts squarely but will begin to try to defend himself against the possibility of revealing his own guilt. 
So with all these things that become pressures in our lives, there are right ways of handling these pressures and wrong ways. If we can develop the habit of handling them the right way, we won't have much more trouble with them. Most persons are perfectly aware of what is the right way in the majority of the problems that face them. Where a few problems become extremely complicated and are obviously beyond our uh, judgment, then any judgment is dangerous. Then the problem is that we must seek help or counsel or advice or be given time to consider and analyze. Consequently, where the problem in our own hearts, we know we cannot cope with it, then we have a right to delay the answer and to make the necessary investigations of the facts rather than to believe such things as might be detrimental to the truth. A good example, for instance, of a certain tendency uh, to uh, emotional mental dishonesty in ourselves is our attitude toward people. Humanity as a whole is a bad news thinker about people. Uh, gossip will travel much further than truth. There's an old saying, you know, that truth crawls along the ground and gossip has wings. And there is a certain amount of that that is real. Also, bad news travels faster than good news. For some reason, the dramatic, which is often the violent, receives the greatest publicity, the greatest recognition, and the greatest attention. Therefore, in our own natures, we must be ever watchful for this. It is much easier for us to build dislikes and sustain them and increase them than it is to sustain likes. Also, there is a natural chemical tendency in people uh, to choose or to not choose other people. These natural psychological tendencies are observable throughout life and there is simply no use in denying them. There are known cases, for instance, in hospitals where a patient with a certain nurse will never recover. The nurse is perfectly sincere, perfectly efficient, but there's a personality clash that will never do any good. A different nurse and the patient begins to improve immediately. There are persons in life that are simply unable to establish close psychic affinities, either in family or in friendship. This does not mean that we have to dislike these people, but it does mean that they are not going to be successful as intimate friends of us or of the individual with whom they do not have this psychic affinity. However, the absence of psychic affinity often leads to an entirely more dis difficult and dangerous situation. Having a certain psychic resistance against these people, we are most certain to agree with any bad report we hear of these people. We know that anything that is said against them must be true. Anything that is said for them is probably untrue. And pretty soon we begin to build up strong likes and dislikes which are based actually only upon psychic pressure in ourselves. Now the pressure may be natural, but to build this pressure into attitudes means that we have to be a little unfair somewhere along the line. The proof of this is the opposite situation in which we have lovingly defended, protected, supported, and suffered for absolute rascals simply because we did have a certain psychic affinity for them. So just as surely as we can like the wrong people, so we can dislike people without any real justification. This justification as we have it may be purely psychological. I know people who have instinctively disliked persons simply because they resembled other individuals with whom this person had a difficulty at some time. A tone of voice, a mannerism is a great help. Also, in the humor quality, we have cheerfulness. And cheerfulness is a natural temperamental asset which will cause us generally uh, to look for good in something. It may get a little platitudinous, it may wear thin in spots, 
but at the same time the generally cheerful attitude, not a frozen cheerfulness that ignores difficulty, but one which takes difficulty in stride and decides that in spite of the clouds that are hanging over at the moment, the sun is still shining somewhere, and we might as well begin thinking about that sun instead of those clouds. Uh, this sense of humor, this cheerfulness, this natural desire to see the good in things and the happiness in things is very valuable because it uh, helps us to keep out of trouble, and if we're in it, it does seem to make it easier to get out, and also easier for other people to help us out if the emergency should arise. We find that uh, humanity in general favors the cheerful person and is more willing to go out of their way to help them. Now, the opposite of this is the melancholy soul. And melancholia is usually a phase of neurosis. The melancholic person is the one who has managed to gradually sell himself a totally negative bill of goods. He has managed to impress upon his own nature the futility of life, the innumerable evils of existence, and has gradually destroyed all sense of adventure all sense of acceptances of the different situations of living. There is no person who is in a more desperate situation than one who is completely sorry for himself. He not only is a burden to his own life, but he is futile in his effort to make any valuable contribution to any other phase of life. So as melancholia comes along, it should be regarded as a definite symptom of psychological illness and should be treated as such. Now the psychologist tries to tell us just what kind of a person would be a good normal type for today. I don't agree with the psychologists on all of these theories of adjustment. I don't think there's anything particularly to be gained by trying to assume that the atomic age is one of the most beautiful periods in history. It would seem to me this is uh, just a superficial, a meaningless uh, attitude. Nor would I say that if we adjusted to society as it is, we'd be happy because society isn't happy. And all the adjustments we can make to it wouldn't prevent us from all still sharing in most of the miseries of our kind. I don't think that those are the foundations upon which normalcy can be considered. But psychology does also have some rather broad general statements about things. Uh, that are more or less obviously true. One is that a person uh, should be very much like a ship on a good deep ocean. Uh, he wants to keep off the rocks, that's obvious. But a ship isn't in the bottom of the sea, it isn't in the air overhead. The ship is sailing on a sea. Uh, part of that ship is under water, invisible. And there is the place where most of the cargo is carried. The ship is, therefore, balanced between elements. Uh, its uh, upper structure is above water. Its uh, tonnage is below water. And it is living on the surface, but with certain depth factors involved in its nature. A man has to live upon the surface of the life that he knows. The surface is here and now. The surface is the day with its problems and its conditions. In order to be successful, the individual must, however, have a certain concealed part of his own nature, that which is below surface or behind surface, or for that matter, from a mystical standpoint, above surface. But it has to be the more or less intangible security for tangible living. And the individual, therefore, cannot afford to drown in a sea of circumstances, and neither can he afford to be unaware of the great element of ocean on which his little ship is sailing. He is trying to direct his course between the world of mind and the world of body. He is trying to live in space and in matter. 
and he is suspended between these two in a kind of middle distance. Consequently, his normalcy for the average person is his ability to focus these forces which are both material and mystical, to focus them upon the emergency problem of his daily existence. Somehow there is great importance psychologically in man in his being right at this moment that all of his agencies, all of his forces conspire or unite or coordinate to make that individual a constructive, normal person today. Now, right here. That in some way that all these other values miss unless the individual is right at this moment in his own existence. Now, there are other moments that went before, and there will be moments that follow after. These have, in various ways, been accepted as part of his psychic existence. But the individual, if he is right at this moment, at the immediate instant, uh, proves pretty well that he has handled his past wisely, and also proves pretty well that he will be able to confront his future wisely. If he's in trouble now, he's in trouble always. That is, that is the trouble that we find he faces. If he's in trouble now, he didn't get over the past troubles. If he's in trouble now, he's going to give his, his own miseries as a priceless heritage to his own future, which is going to have more trouble. So there is something very important about working this problem out immediately. And his present condition is in some way the story of himself. His past has made him what he is, and he will make his future according to his own existence. So if he's in trouble now, this is the only time in which a remedy can be uh, factually and practically applied. And what kind of a person is in trouble? A person who is by nature unhappy. He is in trouble. An individual who doesn't look forward to tomorrow with any kind of relish whatever is unhappy and not adjusted. An individual who can't bear criticism, particularly of his own conduct, has something wrong that has to be made right. The person who doesn't know that he can be better tomorrow than he is today is also in trouble. A person who is perfectly satisfied to do nothing and let the days follow each other in an endless course is likewise in trouble. The, the practical person is the one who takes hold of things now, and as a result of that does not need to escape into the future or defend the past. So defense really has much to do with past action and escape with future action. There are millions of people who live in a kind of psychological utopia. There are better times coming by and by, but I never met one of those people who ever lived to see them. The better times that must come must come now, or else they will never come. The individual to whom the present is only a sad interlude and an anteroom to some unknown future that could be better is missing not only now but destroying the future that he is hoping for. In the same way, a person who lives heavily and miserably upon his own past has indicated that he has found no digestive power within his own psychic nature. He has not been able to transmute anything. He's never been able to outgrow a disaster. The disaster lives and he is the one who is perishing. The inability to transform the past into something constructive, the inability to sense that in the problems that through which we have passed, we find the strength for the solution of these problems. In other words, if we've solved them, we are now free from them. But if we haven't solved them, here they are, waiting as they have always waited for us to do something about them. 
To meet this kind of thinking, we have to sit down somewhere along the line and try to figure out just what we are now. Just what kind of people are we? Are we really in the normalcy range? Not only in terms of psychology, but in terms of universal law and purpose. Are we really uh, in a condition to go forward into the next day or the next year of life with a fair certainty that we will be victorious over the common problems of our days? Or are we going forward with the desperate hope that the days are going to change so that we will not have to? Most people are hoping that times will change. They do. They get a little worse all the time, as far as most people can observe. And they will continue to do so until we start getting better because the called times are just ourselves moving into tomorrow. If we can't get along with ourselves today, we can do no better tomorrow. In fact, it'll be a little worse because the habits are deepening all the time. So look over the tendencies to defenses and escapes with which you yourself may be uh, burdened. How is your, how is your attitude uh, toward the rights of other people. Uh, do you really, honestly, and honorably believe that other people are, are entitled to every consideration that you consider appropriate to yourself? Do you feel that they should be heard just as much as you are heard? Do you feel that they are entitled uh, to the same patience and understanding to which you are entitled? Do you honestly believe that other people may be better than you are because of their achievements or their dispositions or their temperaments? And if they are better than you are, are you glad of it? Now, this is a problem. Are you going to instinctively, intuitively reach out and say congratulations or are you going to let out a deep sniff and say, <laughs> with everything that you have, hmm, they're not any better. If you really knew them, you'd find out just what kind of so-and-sos they really are. <laughs> we say this simply because we do not wish to acknowledge that other people may be better than we are. And we have now a new wave of literature which is concerned almost exclusively with proving that nobody was any good from the beginning of history. What is this? Just a pure defense mechanism. We are such a miserable, disillusioned generation that we cannot allow ourselves to imagine that there was ever a time when anybody was any better. So our modern uh, theater, television, radio, and literature is simply one vast sniff <laughs> in which we are with a certain snicker suggesting that the only reason we admire anybody is because we don't know them. So are we actually able to handle at least the contemporary phase of this situation? When we hear something unpleasant about a person is our first thought to come to their defense? Or is our first thought to say, well, that's probably true. Now let me tell you a little more about it. <laughs> or uh, that you should have heard what I heard. What is our attitude on this? Uh, when we are talking about a person behind their back, do we simply keep so suddenly stop talking and say, we can't say anything unless they're here to defend themselves? You know, that would be a, an end for a large part of conversation, <laughs> especially nowadays. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, the problems of other people's religions or their faith, do we look down with pathos upon some poor old orthodox soul because they haven't received the extra illumination that we possess? Are we honestly able to simply realize that each man's path to God is through his own heart, and that the simple person, worshiping in a simple way and keeping a simple conviction 
may be far better than a person who knows much more but does not keep his convictions so well. Are we thinking constantly of how we can make other people seem better, seem more real and more vital? Or are we simply always taking the attitude that in some way the good of every other person is an insult to us and the misfortunes that have fallen to other people can only remind us how much greater our own have been. This negative situation uh, is really habit forming and has caused a great deal of trouble. It's just a matter of getting down and trying to think these things through because one way of defending our own smallness is to attack the largeness of anyone else. This isn't the answer at all. The answer is to get larger if our smallness is recognized as in our way. If we are interested in some field of activity or move in a group of people with certain special viewpoints or abilities or um, specialized forms of knowledge, are we sincerely trying to equip ourselves uh, to share in that particular activity? Or are we going to try to bluff along without knowing? Or are we going to take the attitude that some take in the presence of learning? Or all these learned people don't know anything anyway, they just talk. Now maybe it's true. I've heard some so-called learned people who talked magnificently for hours and said nothing. It's quite a problem in learning. Uh, a great deal of learning is simply a form of intellectual gymnastics. There's no possible doubt of this. But in any particular case, is it true? That's the question. Sometimes we will find that the learned person is learned. Sometimes we will find that the wise man is wise. Sometimes we'll find that the very simple man is wise. These things we cannot tell by any pattern. Are we trying to live by unsemantic generalities? Are we trying to say that everyone who considers themselves learned is a fool in disguise? If we take an attitude like that, we're going to lose an awful lot in life. Are we going to take attitude that all of a certain class are dishonest, that all of a certain profession are crooks? Are we going to take these attitudes? If we do, the chances are ten to one we're going to meet people in all these classes who are fine persons, honest persons, and well-intentioned persons. Are we going to therefore uh, adjust our thinking, or are we going to keep on talking exactly as we did before? How are we thinking these things through? How are we thinking through problems of intolerance, prejudice? Uh, how are we working with our emotions and our uh, attitudes as times come along? Do we find that every interference is an insult? Do we find that this tremendous drive to do as we please prevents us from being able to bend to any gracious situation for any other person? Have we forgotten the graciousness of giving of our own attitudes? Are we trying to dictatorially take over whole areas of life where other persons have rights, but where we do not wish to admit these rights? Is there a little sneaky selfishness floating around in here somewhere? Uh, do we want to always be a center of attention? Are we working little conspiracies to keep our children from getting away from home and building lives for themselves? Are we trying in some way or another to make life easier for ourselves always at the expense of someone else? There are, time, there are times in this pattern when we'll know it. But if it goes into a pathological degree, then we won't know the truth anymore. And the grave danger in all these psychological problems is that the time comes when we are no longer able to know the truth. We have fooled ourselves until we really have converted ourselves to our own foolishness. As soon as this happens, we become practically airtight. Nothing can reach us. No amount of counsel can reach us. Nothing short of a terrible disaster can crack this shell that we have built around ourselves. Sometimes it can't be broken at all during this lifetime. 
But as we drift along nursing negations or nursing wrong attitudes, there is always the danger that they will suddenly set in with such tremendous force that we can no longer cope with them at all. The same problem arises with alcohol. Now, there are many, many uh, drinkers who never become alcoholics. They, uh, they drink, but the, for some reason the habit never sets in upon them. Granted, every drinker is a possible alcoholic, and no one knows which one is going to become an alcoholic. But we do know that one who is neurotically unstable is one of the best candidates for alcoholism. All worriers will not become neurotics, but among worriers there will be many neurotics. And the worrying tendency is one of the things that makes the neurotic possible. So in all these situations, the drinker who never becomes an alcoholic can stop when he wants to. The drinker who becomes an alcoholic cannot. This is the problem also psychologically speaking. There are worriers who can worry and stop worrying when they please and will do so as long as they live. There are others in whom the habit of worry will gradually build up until they are utterly unable to cope with it. And life will become one terrible, terrifying possibility after another. These people gradually lose all orientation and all ability to face life with any measure of dignity. Now we cannot say which critical person is going to gradually become the psychotic critic. There is no way of knowing, except we do realize that the less stability there is in the first place, the more easily it's lost. And the individual whose psychic load is already heavy is the one most likely to finally uh, come under a general neurotic situation. If there is a sufficient measure of objectivity in the personality, however, the neurosis may be avoided. But it isn't safe to assume that any one person is going to be lucky in this. It is far better to remember that we have 50 million neurotics, and therefore that everyone is an admirable candidate and likely to become more and more involved. Now, there are certain philosophical systems, teachings, and ideas that help a great deal with this problem of neurosis. And an individual who has an adequate philosophy of life and begins to believe it has a great many possibilities of escaping from the pressure of mechanisms of all kinds. If he believes in a lawful universe, if he believes that he has to work out his own salvation with diligence, if he believes that he's in the place he has earned for himself and the only way he can get out is to outgrow it, if he really believes these things, he will not be a neurotic. If he actually and honestly feels that the universe in which he exists is a product of good, is wisely governed, and that he is here for a purpose, and that that purpose is right, he has a pretty fair security against most of the troubles of life. If he adds to this that which philosophy so strongly emphasizes in principle, but which unfortunately American philosophy has not emphasized, namely the importance of creativity and, and the surrounding of his essential program of life with adequate side interests to balance his way of life. If he has interest in music, interest in art, interest in fine things, and at the same time has a fairly adequate central polarity in his job, his work, his family, his home, and things of this nature, he has a pretty good chance of escaping the pressure of neurosis. If, however, he is not reasonably well integrated, he can proceed along foolish lines or be led into foolishness by others and gradually lose this center of security which is essential to him. Normal children, for example, generally speaking, do not psychologically suffer from what might be termed the common circumstances of life. There are a great many families, for instance, in which perhaps through a broken home or through death, 
Children are deprived of some of the intimate association of parents. Sometimes it is necessary for these children uh, to be placed in schools and things of this nature due to uh, the circumstances that factually prevail. Or these children who might have had rather luxurious lives may suddenly be forced to a much more economical way of living. These situations do not normally damage the child. The child is not damaged by facts. The child is damaged by delusions. And as the child grows older, if there was some misunderstanding as to the circumstances, and the child finally sees that the best possible was done, that everyone acted with sincerity, and that all reasonable steps to protect the child's right were taken, the child is seldom seriously damaged. The child is not damaged by normal punishment or correction for real faults. The child is not damaged because it is not overprivileged. The child may feel badly at the moment, but the child is much more apt to be damaged and admit it from many luxuries than from the lack of them. Therefore, the honest relation of facts to people will not normally seriously damage people. The thing that damages is the dishonesty that works into these patterns, the ulterior motives that come out, the selfishness and self-centeredness which the child may not be able to understand but which it feels. Therefore, the sincere person doing the best they can for the child has a good chance of being understood intuitively, if not intellectually, whereas ulterior motive will also sink deep into the subconsciousness of the child and will result in the difficult situation that parents sometimes afterwards cannot understand at all. But the real reason is there was not enough honesty in the pattern all the way through. Too many people were thinking of themselves only, thinking of their own troubles and passing on their own griefs and grievances. There was not a proper sense of unity of thought on the need of the child and the child's rights. So that uh, facts do not generally damage us at any pay stage of life. But distortions of facts, accepted, these will hurt us and hurt us desperately. And the only answer to the problem of fact is that we must all become fact-finding instruments. Each individual must look for and be able to determine the simple and immediate facts of his own existence. This is not as difficult as it appears to be because we are endowed by nature with an amazing sensitivity to fact. The individual who simply is quiet, uses his faculties in the way they were intended, will come up with facts nine times out of ten. The trouble is, the moment the facts come up, the individual resents them, does not want them to be the facts they are, wants them to be something else, because these facts may not be flattering, may not be in accordance with the desires of the person. Therefore, the problem then is how to get out of the facts, how to evade them or disproportion them or distort them until they fit our own preconceptions. Always where we do this, we begin to use defense and escape mechanisms and the justification of the attitudes we wish to take on these different situations. Now, the people come in every week with problems. They've been coming for over 40 years now. And these problems are all of them, or nearly all of them, involved in this inability to look straight in our own faces and see what's there. Most of the problems that beset us most desperately are not really problems in the common sense of the word, they are matters of decision. Many times the decision is overdue. Sometimes it is so far overdue that nobody even wants to make it anymore. But nearly always a problem is a decision that has to be faced. And if we can face this decision with a certain amount of reality, the problem will dissolve. So we suggest very strongly that the persons who find themselves hypersensitive who find themselves getting more and more nervous under the pressure of situations, 
were getting fed up on something, were beginning to, uh, to take intensive attitudes that they are not understood, that they're not valued, that they're not appreciated, that they're not cared for, and all of this type of thing, if these people would just settle down and relax a minute, they will not find it necessary to go into the elaborate programs of justification and compensation uh, which appear to be indicated. Because these problems are nearly always solved simply by relaxing. The individual sits back very quietly and he has the problem that people don't uh, not kind enough to him. Well, there are two answers to that, and they're very simple answers. One is, why should they be? Actually, why should anyone be kind to anybody? Only because they want to. Why should they want to? Because they feel like it. And in this generation, very few people feel like it. <laughs> we are under tremendous tension. The less understanding we have, the worse the tension is. The more understanding we have, the more patient we have to be with the people who don't understand. There is no other answer to this. Therefore, if people do not appreciate us, it may only mean that their minds are on something else. And also, there is this old Socratic idea that actually we don't do things to be appreciated. We do them because they need doing. And most people will appreciate themselves a little, and that will make up for some of the loss as far as other people are concerned. But factually and seriously, it's nice to be appreciated. We all love it, but we can't demand it. Perhaps we honestly believe we deserve it, but still we can't demand it. So if we get it, it's a gracious gesture. If we don't get it, we keep right on. There's nothing else we can do. This is factual. And the moment we start moaning about it, or wondering about it, or feeling bad about it, all we're doing is building up a psychosis. Nature wants us to some way sense, perhaps, that the things that we do that are in conformity to law are right, and their reward is their own rightness. That actually every individual who does good in this world is serving a principle of good. He is not serving other people. And the principle of good will never overlook what he has done. And one way he will find out that it doesn't overlook is the fact that the good he does becomes the basis of the good he is. And nothing that he has done can fail to have its reward in his own consciousness. Therefore, the most important thing in the world, universal life, is forever appreciating him. And is proving this by bestowing its benefits upon him. If, however, for lack of the appreciation of other people who may not have any idea what he's doing in the first place, or wouldn't know whether it was good or bad in the second place, if instead of recognizing this universal life, he clings to his opinion of these people, making his happiness or unhappiness depend upon recognition by others of his own kind, then he must perform such actions as they can recognize. And he probably doesn't want to do that. Because actually, perhaps he feels the things that he are, is doing are more important. Perhaps they are. But to the degree that they are more important than average things, they will not be appreciated by average persons. So he is working now with a full realization that the moment that he becomes an individual, he must, to a certain degree, sacrifice the applause of the masses. He has to do it. He's got to make a decision. Consequently, his decision is the same decision that Socrates had to make. The decision that it is more important to do that which is right than to be popular. The reward lies in the person having the internal integration to do this. If he has it, he has no problem. If he doesn't have it, then it is his natural problem to attain that end to make himself understand the real values of things, to make himself capable of recognizing that no matter what others do, whether they understand him or not, his own 
integration demands that he understand them. And this process of understanding them will almost certainly terminate when it is correctly used in discovering why these people could take no other attitude than the one they did. So to be able to think this through takes us away and out, out of the barriers of the criticism of people who do not understand, the applause of people who do not understand, and the indifference of people who do not understand. These things are natural. And the person who understands has security because his understanding must tell him these things. If his security isn't there, it means that his own understanding is not perfect in this respect or not advanced far enough to sustain him. It is the same thing with his jealousies and his worries and his fears and his hates. There is nothing in this world of which any person need be afraid. There are problems. There are difficult problems. A man must face life, a man must face death. But there is nothing of which man must be afraid. In order to be afraid, your own psychic integration has to be inadequate. This doesn't mean that you are not mindful, that you are not thoughtful, that you are not saddened by situations in which it is obvious great troubles are likely to lurk. But this does not permit the thoughtful person to panic, nor can it cause the thoughtful person to lose sight for an instant of the universal plan which lies under these things and which must fulfill itself. And that good shall come where it is not deserved is not reasonable or right. Therefore, if certain problems arise, they must be faced and met for the good of all concerned, even as the child must be corrected or its character will be damaged. So the individual does not have to be afraid. He does not have to criticize others. He does not have to feel neglected or forlorn or alone. He does not need to be melancholy over anything because the problems that face him are natural problems which can be handled by natural means if he will not distort them with imagination. It's always to keep the facts straight. And that is the simple way by which we preserve our own mentalities. The moment the thoughts get out of order, our basic mind begins to lose its integration. And if we permit all kinds of confusion to take the place of fact, the mind is unable to bear confusion beyond a certain degree. And under constant confusion, it begins to break. It shows too much exhaustion. And the person of today does not exhaust the mind by its use. He exhausts it usually by abusing it. He exhausts it by burdening it with comparatively worthless problems, by involving it in meaningless controversies, and by exhausting its resources in the maintenance and defense of emotional excesses. If the mind is cleared from these things, it can think straight. Now, the emotional nature of man is also involved in nearly all of the complexes and pressures which affect him. And this is true also of his escape and defense problems. The emotional nature of man is tied very closely, for instance, to the emotional impulse to run, to run away from a situation, to panic, or to have all kinds of involved feelings about things, great bursts of feeling one way or another. These emotions simply feed pressure. They build up pressure, and they interfere with the ability of the individual to handle his own mental problems in reasonable and rational ways. So the thoughtful person, the wise person, realizes that his understanding, his patience, his ability to think through things, is, is a con these are constant defenses against his emotions. The minute he cannot cope with a situation mentally, he becomes emotional. But when he can quietly recognize justice and cling to it, emotion isn't involved in any strong way. When he sees truth, emotion is quiet. 
when he becomes involved in untruth, emotion flares. So that wherever we have defenses and escapes, we have a powerful emotional pressure. But if we have quiet solution, the emotions rest, bestowing upon us only the enrichment of our constructive attitudes. Emotions taking our friendship warms it. Our understanding lightens it. All these things the emotion can accomplish gently. But the moment the mind goes off the track and becomes uh, pressure ridden, it drags the emotions with it. And the emotions become uh, turmoiled by the uh, insecurities, the inconsistencies, and apparently the injustices of life. So we can get very emotional over these things. Whereas our emotions should be reserved very largely for our appreciation, for our genuine admiration of the wonder of life itself, and our adoration for the great creator of all good things. Our emotions should be constructive, not destructive. But if we are not able to uh, give the mind emotional support and the emotions mental support, we are unable to accomplish this end. Therefore, our emotions vitalize our escapes and our defenses, and this leads us more rapidly into a psychotic condition. Now, no, most persons are certainly not in a situation where they're not able to control these things. But most persons are not in a condition in which they are getting the maximum support from their own minds and emotions. There already there are some habits by which we are wasting or draining off energy to support notions, opinions, complexes, or fixations, or in which we are using energies to support our weaknesses rather than to correct our weaknesses, or are using energy to tear down other person's virtues rather than building our own. So wherever there is a waste of energy, uh, we have a, a tendent lack of efficiency and gradual de depletion of vitality. Whereas the proper use of energy is a continual exercising of the energy factor. An energy right you, rightly used renews itself. Wrongly used exhausts itself. To keep our energies, to keep our peace of mind, our poise and our happiness, therefore, we must neither run away from anything or defend ourselves when we are wrong. Instead of building defenses and escapes, we must gradually insist upon the immediate solution of problem by fact. This is the kindly thing. The most loving thing in the world is the truth. And where we try to love people by protecting from them from the truth, we do very little good. We must protect them for the truth. And we must inspire them with the truth in their own consciousness. These things lift our responsibilities. A few simple concepts, and we set another person upon a straight way of life. Whereas if they live with us through years of our own evasions and intemperances, they have gained nothing and perhaps have lost a great deal of ground. So we say that the problem of the escape mechanism, the defense mechanisms, these are problems which we can solve by sitting down quietly and saying to ourselves, is there anything that can make us create this defensive attitude or force us into a panic to escape? Is there anything we're running away from? Is there anything we're building an artificial defense against? If these exist, think them through, work them out, and if the knowledge is inadequate, gain new knowledge so that they, the individual can live without being afraid of any pressure but able to accept pressure quietly, transform it into experience, and grow with it or by it into the next step of his own life. If he does these things, he will be pretty safe against the neurotic dangers of the so-called polar mechanisms, the mechanisms which affect adversely the lives of most human beings. Well, I guess that's all for this evening, folks. Thank <laughs> you.